All right, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our next, next speaker, Dr. Sylvia Secchi. Sylvia is a professor in the Department of uh, Geographical and Sustainability Science at the University of Iowa, the epicenter of uh, nutrient management issues in North America. <laughs> um, and uh, her work focuses on the interface between agriculture and the environment, particularly water and carbon. She's a natural resource economist by training, and her work typically combines methodologies from the social sciences, the natural sciences, and engineering. And I also can tell you that along with colleagues, she runs a podcast called We All, we All Want Clean Water and uh, deals with a lot of these uh, issues head on. And so I encourage you to have a listen to it. It's quite uh, uh, interesting and provocative. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia. Slaughtering sacred cows, tech fixes won't correct the extractive nature of U.S. agriculture. Um, all right, so you guys can see? Okay, so um, I uh, uh, really want to uh, uh, bring back some strands from the presentation that Jonathan had earlier this morning. And I want to start from scratch a little bit of basics of environmental economics, okay? There's basically three ways in which we can reduce pollution, writ large. So this applies for point source, non-point source, carbon, P, and uh, selenium, whatever, right? So we can reduce production of the good that's causing the pollution. We can change the input mix to uh, a mix that is less polluting, or we can do end of pipe treatment. When we're talking about uh, agriculture and water pollution from phosphorus, what we can do is reduce production of the crops, uh, corn, because you know this is my uh, Iowa bias, but it could be other things. It could be alfalfa. It could be whatever uses uh, the fertilizer. So we can produce less of the crop that causes the problem. We can use less fertilizer, we can use slow release fertilizer, we can do no fall applications of fertilizer, and I hope there aren't a lot of farmers in the room because otherwise I'm gonna have to run after this talk. Or we can do end of pipe treatment. We can do chemical treatment, we can do grass waterways, field borders, whatever. The problem is that in our current political environment, doing A is, not even on the table, and in fact, we are paying farmers to cause pollution. What do I mean by that? I'm gonna take you back, and uh, I assume most people have taken Economics 101, right? And so you've seen demand and supply, and this is the market equilibrium, right? Uh, so what we're doing in the United States is we have things like the ethanol mandate, that causes um, an increase in the demand for corn. And then we have crop insurance subsidies that reduce the costs of production of crops, particularly corn, uh, that are big leakers. Corn production is leaky by nature, okay? And so what that means is that our new equilibrium is more corn, uh, the price effect, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to be sitting here defending uh, that PO versus P0, which one is higher, which one is lower, but for our purposes, these are the external costs of pollution, okay, and the way we measure them is the area under the cost of pollution curve, and so the market itself would cause an amount of pollution equal to the area W, but because we're paying to produce more of the crop that causes the pollution, we have extra area Z. So our policies to start with, because they're very production driven, are making the problem worse. We are paying farmers to pollute, and then we're paying them again to reduce that pollution. 
This is, for those of you who have studied economics, absolutely highly inefficient, okay? I would be happy if we paid farmers to stay home rather than do this. Um, and I'm not gonna go into what a great idea corn ethanol production is. Uh, you know, at best, is ge it generates as many greenhouse gas emissions as um, the gasoline it takes the place of, okay? So uh, th there's other environmental costs uh, that are not necessarily modeled here. So this is our first problem, that instead of producing less of the crops that generate the pollution, we are producing more. The other thing is we are not considering a lot of the uh, policies in that D category. The certainly the ones that we are cons considering are all based on voluntary approaches. Uh, you know, in, I was just um, talking to somebody before uh, the, um, we started again, and uh, as I left Iowa, the smell of hog shit followed me to the airport because it's fall application of manure time in Iowa. And even though I live in one of the few counties that doesn't have a lot of CAFAs, the smell comes all the way from upstream, okay? So uh, there were proposals, for example, to reduce fall application of fertilizers and uh, do better with the application of manure, and they haven't gone anywhere. It's all based on a voluntary approach. So what that means is we are putting all our eggs in the end of pipe treatment basket. And again, if you've uh, taken any economics class, you will know that that means that that C channel is overused. We need to do a lot more of end of pipe treatment than we would do otherwise if we had all the options available to us. Typically, the optimum mix of things to do include some reduction in production for example, in Iowa, believe it or not, we grow corn in the two-year floodplain. That means that every other year, the chances that those nutrients will end up in our waters are very high. Why do we do that? Because we have the crop insurance subsidy system. And so if your corn and your nutrients end up in the water, it doesn't matter to the farmer because they get compensated. So we have a voluntary approach problem in the United States. The, um, and there is no um, balancing feedback loop there. Even if we know this voluntary approach is not working, we are not changing the policy. And we've seen in Iowa, for example, the, the um, Raccoon River watershed, uh, which is one of the uh, which is the infamous Des Moines um, Waterworks Lawsuit Watershed. Um, well, in the past couple of years, they returned 80% of the funding for voluntary practices. Why? Because there were no volunteers. Because the Des Moines Waterworks Lawsuit did not pan out, uh, it was thrown out of court, and so farmers know that there isn't even the threat of a stick at the moment. So it doesn't matter how big the carrot is, if they don't want to do it, they won't do it. So we have a voluntary approach problem. We also have, in Iowa in particular, an accounting problem. If you look at our um, uh, magnificent nutrient reduction strategy documents, which, by the way, are the only documents that are produced in partnership with the land-grant university. None of the other Mississippi River watershed states have the land-grant university be not only a science body, but also committed to a policy approach, regardless of whether it's succeeding or not, okay? If you look at these documents, they will count how much money we've spent on best management practices. They won't count how many more CAFOs we have, okay? So, we have to consider both sides of the ledger. It's not just how many uh, prairie strips or how many grass waterways you're putting in. It's how many more pigs are also being raised in the state, okay? Um, and we also like to look at money spent 
which is uh, even more misleading because land prices in Iowa are like skyrocketing. And so to buy the same amount of conservation land is more expensive. So we're, we're spending more by putting less land into um, conservation reserve program, for example. But if you look at the money, hey, look at that investment. So um, here is what we like to do in Iowa is we like to look at um, partial inputs. Uh, this is a, a fight that's actually going on right now because uh, the industry is alleging that we've actually reduced phosphorus just by looking at the number of BNPs on the ground, regardless of what the water quality monitoring data are telling us. This is where we are, okay? It's a pure fantasy land um, when, we, when it comes to measuring progress uh, on these issues. So we have also a concentration problem in Iowa. We produce the fecal equivalent. Um, this was estimated by my uh, podcast co-host, Chris Jones, uh, who's a research engineer at the university. We produce the fecal equivalent of 164 million people. We have less than three and a half million actual people in the state. And of course, those 164 um, million people fecal equivalent is not treated. It's very highly concentrated in the northwestern part of the state where we pretty much don't have enough land to apply the manure. So when people say, oh, manure is a valuable resource, uh, it depends not just on the average, but it depends on the concentration of manure. We produce one third of US hogs in Iowa, which by the way, is not a coincidence. It's because we don't have any regulations. And so farmers can count the same field 15 times because DNR is not, the Department of Natural Resources is not monitoring whether the field is double, triple, quadruple, quintuple counted, okay? So we have a concentration problem, which means that in Iowa, manure is a waste product, not a um, substitute for commercial fertilizer. And you can see this in fertilizer sales numbers. Our fertilizer sales numbers have not been decreasing as the number of animals has been increasing. Just to give you a sense of how bad the concentration problem is, this is from the Census of Agriculture. In 1974, we had 10 times the number of hog farms that we have now. So we've gone from uh, almost 60,000 to uh, less than uh, 6,000, and we have doubled the number of pigs from, this is inventory numbers, so every year, you know, a pig lives six months. Uh, it's a fun life to be a pig in Iowa. Uh, I can't document it because we have ag-gag laws, by the way, uh, uh, which make it very difficult to show you the conditions, the hygienic conditions this hogs live in. So we've doubled the number of hogs, and it's actually even worse than what I'm showing you because if you do the math with the smaller operations, the smaller operations can at most produce half of those pigs. So what that means is that 1,000 operations are raising 10 million hogs in Iowa. Liquid manure that comes out of these production systems is not very valuable. It's hard to haul, and so it tends to concentrate right next to those operations. And, and you know, where Iowa goes, so goes the nation. I am um, um, warning you all that unless we do something about it, this problem is going to continue. We see this at a national level. Numbers, for example, of dairy um, have remained more or less constant but look at the number of farms. Number of hogs has gone up. And again, look at the number of farms. What that means is average farm size is increasing. What that means is we have more manure that is a waste product, okay? And uh, I was trained as an economist. And so um, when they come up with, my colleagues come up with this efficiency argument, um, I, 
you know, my eyes roll to the back of my head, okay? The efficiency argument is an economist's red herring because it does not consider this monumental environmental costs. And I know we're talking about P here, but the climate change implications of our confined livestock system in the United States are huge as well, okay? So it's more efficient if we don't count certain costs. It's as if my kid came home with five Fs and one A and said, oh, my average is an A. Don't look at those Fs, okay? And the fact is that we can't count correctly a lot of those environmental costs. They are very difficult to put a number on, okay? Um, and the other problem we have, as Jonathan, I think, made it really abundantly clear, is that our conservation pro programs in the United States are secondary. They're ancillary to our production programs. When we want to go fence row to fence row, when corn eth the corn ethanol mandate shoots up corn prices, CRP acreage goes down, okay? The conservation title of the farm bill has not just an environmental goal, it has a income support goal, and it has a um, production, indirect uh, production uh, support goal as well. So we cannot continue um, with the current system which uh, relies on the voluntary approach, this end of pipe treatments, these uh, tech fixes uh, to address solutions as we have continued consolidation, increasing farm size, and in, in the case of several kinds of livestock, increase in the number of animals. And I think this point was made earlier this morning. Uh, it's not just the phosphorus problem to be considered in isolation. We also have to see this from a systems of systems uh, perspective as uh, and seeing the linkages with climate change, okay? And well, unfortunately, what we're seeing now is everybody is into the carbon trading, uh, carbon payments, carbon offsets, uh, um, bandwagon, and uh, this is gonna cause more problems in terms of nutrient pr pollution. For example, in Iowa, we have already exempted farms uh, that implement bioreactors from oversight and a regulation uh, uh, regarding their expansion. So we're gonna see even more concentration. All these bioreactors don't do anything for NMP. And the digest state is unregulated in Iowa by law, okay? Um, so what we need is we need to make systemic changes, not this piecemeal, more bioreactors, more prairie strips without considering the system level impacts. So here are uh, some conservation policy best management practices for you. We shouldn't count practices. Um, we should look at edge of field impacts whenever we can and watershed level in analysis whenever we can because that allows us to look at both sides of the ledgers and to look at impacts where they matter, the point of contact where people you know, where the intake for the water treatment plant is, where the, where the um, people go fishing or people go swimming. Uh, we must consider livestock. All these, like, you know, in Iowa, we're having like a prairie strip moment. Uh, and I'm like, look at all the pigs. You know, I'm like, you know that LeBron meme? Like, look here, the pigs, man. Um, and upstream emissions. Those pigs eat corn. That corn is produced in a leaky system. We should look at scalability of programs. I can't tell you how many rural sociologists and environmental economists employed by the land grant system are writing papers as we speak about the challenges that farmers face to adopt more conservation practices. Nobody is writing papers looking at what is the hard limit on the number of farms that will adopt them because that limit is not zero. 
farmers in Iowa farming at 75, 80 years old with a condo in Fort Myers, a condo in Scottsdale, they are not going to change the way they farm. And we are living under the assumption that we can get widespread adoption of these practices, even regardless of the cost. They are not going to do it. I'm telling you. They return the money at the Raccoon River watershed. They have no reason to do it because the threat of a stick. Um, thanks, Nancy Stoner, by the way, uh, is completely gone. Okay. So um, we need to think about our subsidy system overall. We are causing more pollution. Cross compliance, which the conservation compliance. Um, uh, part of the farm bill uh, mandates for highly erodible land is a very powerful tool. We are paying these farmers a lot of money, especially in the Midwest. We are paying them to pollute without asking anything in return. Um, and I, I can tell you also that in Iowa what's coming is uh, people are going to argue that um, upgrades to tile drainage systems provide social benefits and if you believe that, I've got a bridge that I want to sell you. Um, uh, come and see me afterwards, OK? We are going to be spending a lot of money um, on private activities that only convey private benefits and cause more environmental costs if we're not careful. Um, so here's my final thoughts. We have artificially restricted the policy options on the table. As scientists, we should always consider all the policy options. I have had conversations with colleagues at land grants who say, well, yeah, but the amount of corn we produce is given. It's exogenous. Hell no. Don't concede that. This is a policy decision we are making, and we should be envisioning scenarios in which we make different choices. This um, kind of like going down the same road of more tech, more end of pipe treatment uh, is causing, um, is having devastating effects in rural America. Because what we're seeing is farm consolidation, less and less people on the landscape, uh, school districts closing, consolidating, uh, less and less services. Our county sanitarians are overworked. Okay, we don't have maternity wards in rural hospitals. And this is the kind of agricultural production system that we call efficient, because we are not looking at those costs. And finally, this is uh, called slaughtering sacred cows, right? The title of my talk. The solution to this problem is to actually slaughter fewer cows. And until and unless we face that fact, that we're producing too much livestock because we're not accounting for the social cost of our production system. Until, until and unless we consider these, we're not going to get uh, um, out of this problem. Okay? Uh, there's not enough biodigesters to take care of the pollution caused by uh, our livestock system. And la la the last slide I want to leave you with is we are paying for this. We are paying for this in many ways. We, I have here, um, oh, the years are, are looking very uh, close in my slide here. We're paying in the Farm Bill. Or we're paying in the Inflation Reduction Act now. We're paying with uh, public agricultural research and development that actually makes the problem worse. So because we are paying for this, we should be able to do a better job. This is not a market-driven system. It is completely driven by federal and state policies that we are paying for. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. So we have two questions that have come up already. One says, Sylvia. How much of WNC areas under the curve is contributed to pea pollution? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we don't really um, 
measure, you know, I, I can I can draw the, the kind of like um, uh, theoretical kind of like general diagram, but we have not been measuring P pollution as much as N, particularly in the Midwest. And the reason why is because we are being driven by drinking water consideration. And so a lot of the research is really based on, you know, uh, high nitrate numbers. But certainly, you know, in fresh water systems, P is a critical element. And everybody who has any money in Iowa is in Minnesota in the summer because our lakes and rivers are not fit for recreation. So we have losses in recreational activities. Uh, we have uh, losses in, in terms of property values. Uh, you know, the, the people who live near uh, lakes that are, um, you know, really in terrible conditions uh, are losing in property values. Uh, we have all sorts of costs that uh, we have just begun to, um, to estimate. And, and, you know, there's the link between N and P that makes it harder to separate the two. So um, uh, I think that that's where we should be spending some money, right? Not looking at the benefits of BNPs, but looking at the costs of the current system. Hi. So in, um, in Ohio, a lot of our um, hog operations tend to uh, operate just under the limit for needing to be um, classified, you know, with an NPDES permit, which has made it exceedingly difficult to actually know how many farms there are and any details about where manure is going. Are you seeing similar things in Iowa? Oh, my God, yes. Not only that, but if, you know, if you were my sister, we would be operating two separate operations right next to each other, right below the threshold. And if you had a husband who works full time somewhere else, he would be a third partner in the operation. I mean, the shenanigans that are going on um, in terms of like gaming the system in Iowa are, you know, off off the roof. That's why we have so many hogs. It's because it's so easy. Right, so we have all the corn, right? And now we have the DDGs from the ethanol production. And our Department of Natural Resources, which is now, by the way, led by a former agricultural lobbyist, okay, um, is saying that when we have um, E. coli um, advisories on our beaches, it's because of the geese. So yeah, I mean, I, the stories I could tell you uh, about, uh, you know, they, they, they operate um, under um, LLCs, they involve all the family members, uh, all the hog houses are allegedly under the system. By the way, one of the issues we have is we know for a fact that they are um, cramming in more animals than the houses have uh, space for because then the manure is spread when it's not supposed to be spread. Right, because if you have more animals than you're authorized, instead of applying in the spring, you have to apply when there's snow on the ground. Which, by the way, we allegedly have a law that prohibits it, but there's so many loopholes in that law, it's um, it's it's like a, a nice piece of Swiss cheese. So I'm going to ask one uh, last question on here. It says, "How would we shift towards reducing livestock production?" when demand for meat abroad continues to drive production and export? So, um, you know, I am trained as an economist, and so economists are fixated with causality. What is driving demand? Is it that people want more meat, or is it that we have all that meat, and therefore it's cheap? I do think that there is an equity aspect here to consider, right? Uh, in the sense that we don't want meat to become a luxury product that only rich people can afford. But, um, you know, what we're doing is we are making Americans more obese and we are sending meat to China, which we're having trade wars with, by the way. Uh, so I think that uh, we can take a step back and reflect upon all the subsidies, direct and indirect, that are causing these high levels of meat consumption. 
It's not that people in America woke up and said, I need to have McDonald's burgers at, um, I'm, I'm Italian, by the way, and this whole idea of ch cheap food is demeaning to me. It's, it's the way this country operates, the cheaper the food, the better, is wrong. You are wrong. You've been wrong for so long. We need to fix that. Cheap food is not a good thing. People should have living wages to buy decent food to start with, okay? Um, and cheap food that degrades the environment isn't really cheap.